interruptions at all. And uh, we are going to continue our series called The Power of Easter. The Power of Easter. And uh, today, of course, we're going to talk about Palm Sunday. Uh, for those who are the guests here today, we just want to know we love you. We're glad you're here. We're glad you found your way to church. And uh, you're a guest for one Sunday, and then after that, you're family. At least that's how we feel about it. So uh, we'd love you to make this your church place. Now, so the power of Easter. We talked about first week the power of faith. Talked about how Jesus healed two, two uh, folks on his way to Jerusalem through faith. Then we talked about uh, hope. And then today I want to talk about another kind of power that is uh, part of uh, our Easter celebration. So, let me find my notes in the right place. Here we go. You guys want to hear a good uh, Easter joke? All right, I'm glad you guys are like me. You like to have a little fun when you're, when you're in church. So, a little girl uh, and her family used to go to church every Sunday, and they would go to Sunday school and make the whole morning of it. And uh, one day, though, this little girl was... Uh, was sick, and so she had to stay home from church. And when mom and dad and the siblings uh, all came back, uh, the little girl said to them, you know, so how was, how was church? I'm so glad I, I missed it. And uh, they said, well, this was Palm Sunday. So we were remembering how Jesus came into town. Everybody waved their palm branches to honor him. So we got these palm branches today as we were celebrating Jesus coming into the town. And the little girl looked at mom and dad. She said, oh, shucks. The one day I miss church is the day Jesus showed up. <laughs> oh, amen. All right, Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. Praise the Lord. And uh, we're going to start with verse 28 and read through verse 44. Luke 19, 28 through 44. Praise God. And take a moment and get us all centered on the Lord as we jump in here. It says, when he had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples, saying, go into the village opposite you, where as you enter you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it, just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, why are you loosing the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus. And they threw their clothes on the colt, and they sat Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then as he was drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Now as he drew near, he saw the city, and he wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this, your day, the things that make for your peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because... You did not know the time of your visitation. This is the account of Palm Sunday. It's the account of Jesus entering Jerusalem for 
uh, his last week, the Holy Week, his last week of life. And you might recall how we have talked about Jesus on the road to Jerusalem. How on the road to Jerusalem, he met a blind man. He met lepers and healed them. How he stopped in Jericho and brought Zacchaeus to salvation. This is the next step in that, the traveling up the hill to Jerusalem. They would come to Mount Olivet, kind of go over the rise, and then descend a little bit and go into uh, Jerusalem. This was the common way it was done. It was the way you would go to Jerusalem. There would have been lots and lots of people, but we'll talk about that more. Now, this day, we have palms there, and, and uh, you know we often think of it as the day we wave the palms. But I just want to let you know there is so much more going on here than just children waving palms. What you have in this story is the fulfillment of prophecies that are thousands of years old that came to pass in this story, in this moment. And let me just take one rabbit trail. Remember, these are real stories. Somebody say, Amen. This isn't a movie. This is not fantasy. It's not mythology. This really happened. This is historical fact. There was a day when all of these things written here actually occurred. It's important to recognize that, that Jesus was a real person. Jerusalem, a real place. Passover, a real season. And he was part of all of that And I say that because sometimes we want to take the story of Jesus and all of these things, and we want to turn them into some sort of a mythology wrapped up with bunnies and eggs and and, Easter bonnets and, and kind of wrap it all in some sort of a thing. Listen, listen, this is real history for the salvation of our souls. So we read it with a sense of reverence because it really happened. In fact, it was the fulfillment of prophecies. One of them is Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. There are lots of them in these moments. But Zechariah 9 and 9 says, Rejoice greatly, daughters of Zion. Shout, daughters of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly, riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, The battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. You know, this this prophecy is is interesting because um, at one point in history, many years after this, a Muslim conqueror named Suleiman, no, not the Neil Diamond song, the real guy, Suleiman, He conquered Jerusalem, and he read this prophecy in Zechariah where the coming Messiah would enter through the, and they knew it would be in the east gate, so he took and walled in the east gate, thinking he could keep the Messiah from going inside and somehow keep his rule going. This prophecy was written 480 B.C., so somebody who's good at math tell me how many years before Jesus' entry was 480 B.C. Got any mathematicians? It's about 480 years. Plus or minus Jesus is 30. So that's a long time. Now, the the Romans knew about this prophecy. Somebody say amen. Remember, the Romans are sort of in this story the bad guys. And they knew about this prophecy. They knew that at the Passover time, the Messiah would appear, and they knew that he would come to uh, bring uh, peace and overthrow their rule. And so at the Passover time, let me just give you some history here, bring this to reality. During the Passover, the city of Jerusalem would have been filled with thousands upon thousands of Jewish people coming to celebrate Passover in the city. It would have been packed you know, like, like, like Mardi Gras and New Orleans or whatever. I mean, just, you know, elbow-to-elbow people. People were sleeping everywhere they could, every, every, every hotel, every corner, every barn, people everywhere to celebrate Passover. Now, the Romans knew that this was a volatile time. They knew that people were coming there to celebrate 
the coming Messiah, who was going to be the deliverer of the people. So the Romans would flood Jerusalem with soldiers to keep the peace. So you had all of these uh, Jewish people there celebrating, plus all of the Roman guards there to keep the peace. So the situation was volatile. Do you get it? Remember, the Romans were conquerors. They were occupiers. Let's, let me give you a head nod. Did the Jewish people like the Romans? No, not a bit. And they would never miss a chance to take a swat at one or a stab at one or something. And so these Roman soldiers are there amongst all of these folks, and they are on edge. You know, some of you guys I know were in uh, the Iraq War. And you remember what it was like to have people around you at any time could pull out a gun and shoot you or stab you or step on a bomb. Now, they didn't have guns, but they had knives and things. And those Roman soldiers knew that any time in this crowd, something could happen. So it was volatile. It was, it was a time of great tension. All these people in an enclosed area. And then they get rumor that this Jesus of Nazareth, the miracle-working guy, was coming. He had, they hear rumors, because remember, this traveled fast. They didn't have CNN, right? I mean, word traveled by mouth quickly. He had healed those lepers on the road. They heard about that. They heard about the blind man who got his sight restored. And then they heard this story about this tax collector named Zacchaeus coming to faith. And this guy, who they understood was setting himself up to be the Messiah, was coming to town. Now, how do you suppose they thought about that? They were worried and concerned. Now, one of the things we didn't have time this year to talk about was the healing of Lazarus. And someday you'll have to look at that story because it takes place in the same time frame. But you might remember that he raises Lazarus from the dead. And if you look at that story, the last lines of that story are, the Sadducees and Pharisees sought to arrest him. They put a warrant out on Jesus. He was a wanted man. So this is the guy who's coming into uh, Jerusalem. Now, here's where I want to give you a little, little Jewish history. Are you guys okay with this? Dig it a little deeper. Peel off a few layers. Okay. Now, we all know that Passover, the season of Passover, it wasn't a one-day kind of thing. They would celebrate for like a week. And the people would come early to get set up and be able to have their, their, their Passover. Now, what's interesting that in the Passover, on, uh, according to the scriptures, they were to take a lamb on the 10th of the month. And on the 10th of the month would be four days prior to the 14th of the month, which is when they would have their Passover dinner. We would call it Monday, Thursday. They'd have Passover. So they would have pick a lamb on the 10th. Four days later, they would sacrifice it and eat it. And tradition had it, Jewish tradition, that they were released from their bondage in Egypt on the 15th. So you had this four-day thing. So the family would go on uh, what would probably be about a Monday to pick out a lamb that they were going to sacrifice on Passover. And if you show a picture here, what's interesting about this, I think we have a picture of, there we go. If you go back to Egypt when this whole thing began, the Egyptians had a god that was like a lamb. The Egyptians' god was Amun. It was the ram god, uh, the sheep god. And so what's interesting in all this historically is that the Jewish people, remember, they were slaves in Egypt. Everybody remember that? They may not have owned lambs. Where would they go to get a lamb? Well, they'd have to go to the Egyptians. So there was this historical event called the fighting of the firstborn when the, the, uh, uh, the Jewish people would go to the Egyptians and say, I need a lamb for this thing we're doing, and then uh, God is going to strike all your firstborn dead. Well, you suppose the Egyptians were thrilled to hear that? What if you were a firstborn? You're going, what? What's going to happen? And, and so there was actually historically a thing they called the fighting of the firstborn, where, they, where the firstborn were trying to fight and have a whole problem with this whole thing. So they would get a, the point would be they'd get a, a lamb. And then they had the lamb for four days. 
at their house. And during that four-day time, they would inspect the lamb to make sure it was perfect and spotless. Because remember, it had to be a perfect, spotless sacrifice on Passover. Now, if you've got kids, and some of you guys have had kids or grandkids, you know how attached they get to pets. It doesn't take four days to get attached to a pet. So you can imagine this cute little ram or lamb and you're running around the house, and the kids are getting attached, and they're feeding the lamb, and they got four days when they're inspecting this thing and getting it ready to go. And then they would have to take it and sacrifice it for the Passover dinner, the perfect lamb. Now, this was the backdrop to Palm Sunday, which you've got to understand, is they, the people knew that they would be selecting a lamb, they would be killing the lamb, the lamb had to be a perfect sacrifice, and they also would remember the story of the lamb's blood being put on their doors so sin would pass over, back in the original Passover. So when Jesus is entering the city, he is coming in as this perfect lamb four days before the Passover. See, it's amazing the timing, how it's all perfect. So as he's coming in, they're proclaiming him their savior. It's on the day that they would have gone out to pick a lamb and bring it home. And he's coming in at that time. Now, it's interesting that he says he, he, brought a, he rode in on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, again, this is something that's uh, really interesting because this would have been a donkey, a foal of a donkey that had never been ridden. It was something that was sacred and given over to God. And so that's the animal carrying the Savior in. Now, they were shouting at that time. They were saying, salvation, Hosanna, salvation. Now, they were probably thinking something very different than we think about. Okay, if you were a Jewish person at that point, you were hoping that Jesus would be the reincarnation, so to speak, of David, King David, that you'd be coming to set up the David throne, that you'd get rid of stupid Romans once and for all, that you'd raise up an army, chase them all out of town, and set up this, this, this whole thing. But we understand, of course, that's not the kind of salvation Jesus was talking about. In fact, if they'd been listening, they'd have known that. Because he said several times, my kingdom is not of this earth. But that's what many of them were thinking about. Now, here's something you might want to make a note of. Again, the symbolism of this story is fascinating. When a king, an earthly king, would go to war, he would ride out of the city in front of his army, and he would ride a horse. Some would say horse. He's riding a horse. He'd go to war on a horse. When, he, when a king would want to negotiate peace, he would want to go have a, a peace meeting with another king or general, he wouldn't ride a war horse. He would ride into the city a donkey. The donkey symbolized, I'm coming in peace. So when Jesus is riding a donkey, he's coming in peace. Not war, but peace. And if you look carefully at what he said about not knowing the time of their visitation, how he'd come to bring peace, we understand that Jesus was coming to bring peace. Now, as he rode in, there were at this point, uh, there were eight gates around Jerusalem. The gate he would have went in was the eastern gate. The eastern gate was the only gate you could be on Mount, Mount of Olives, Mount Olivet, and look down to the city and see right through the gate. Yeah, there you can see. Oh, and by the way, here's, it's called the Mercy Gate. And what's interesting, you see how it's filled in? See the, the arches and under that? That's what Suleiman did. He walled it in so the Messiah couldn't get in, thinking that would somehow save his kingdom. Of course, in Jesus' time, it would have been open. And this wouldn't be the original gate, by the way. This gate was rebuilt uh, after the 80, 70 conquer. The real gate is under it, under all that rubble and stuff. But this is where the eastern gate would be found. And so this eastern gate was called the mercy gate. And again, you think about Jesus riding in, proclaiming peace, and bringing mercy through that, through that door. Now, it also tells us something about uh, how Jesus wanted his kingdom to be done. 
Is everybody awake? Are you with me now? See, Jesus was coming to that gate and the people proclaiming him king. And they were looking for a military leader, a political leader. But that's not what Jesus had in mind. He wasn't bringing military power like Pilate brought. He wasn't bringing political power like Herod brought. He wasn't bringing violence like Barabbas brought. He wasn't bringing an oppressive religion like the Pharisees had. What he was bringing was the power of peace. Peace with God. Peace with our fellow man. Now in that crowd, let's just imagine for a minute that we're all in that crowd. In fact, we're going to do that again when we worship later in song. But imagine we're in the crowd as Jesus is riding up the, up the dirt road there to enter the city. Who would have been in the crowd? Well, first of all, there would have been some people who loved him. Somebody say amen? A lot of folks. I mean, he was famous. He was well known. There would have been people there. It might have been Bartimaeus. Remember blind Bartimaeus? He might have been there. Very likely Lazarus, who had been raised from the dead, could have been there. Maybe Mary, maybe Martha were in the crowd. Maybe those lepers that he cleansed, they could have been in the crowd. Possibly Jairus' daughter. Maybe the man who had been healed of demons lived in the tombs. Maybe Zacchaeus. Maybe some of the 5,000 he fed. These folks could have been in the crowd proclaiming him their king. Amen? They loved him. There were also been there in that crowd those who wanted him dead. People who wanted him extinct, gone, buried. Some of the Pharisees, probably most of the Sadducees. They were jealous. They wanted to discredit him. They wanted to pounce on him. These folks would not have been his friend. They would have been in the crowd. Oh, the Romans would have been in the crowd, for sure. The Roman soldiers, they were afraid of a revolt, trying to keep the peace at all costs. Then there would have been some in the crowd who wanted to use Jesus for their own purposes. People like the Jewish zealots who wanted him to raise up an army and actually have a war with the Romans. People like Judas Iscariot who wanted Jesus to make him money. Scripture tells us Judas would pilfer from the money that Jesus had. There would have been some who uh, would have just been looky-loos. Amen? Ah, there's a few who don't know what's going on. They're just watching, listening. What in the world is this, you know? Just a few looky-loos that would have been there. Now, they're laying down their clothes and their, and their palms on the road. This is something they would do for a king. This was a way of saying, this man on this colt is a king. And he's entering the city in a donkey, bringing peace, proclaiming himself as the king. Now, let me ask you this. If you were the Romans... How do you feel about somebody being named a king? You're probably not very thrilled with that, are you? Because who's supposed to be king? Caesar. In fact, by proclaiming him king, some of those folks were committing treason. They were proclaiming loyalty to Jesus over Caesar. It was hot. It was smelly. There are animals there's, it's just a crazy cacophony of sound. In the midst of all this, they're laying down their coats. They're proclaiming him the king. They're waving their palms. And they're proclaiming, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they're making such a ruckus that the entire place is paying attention to what's going on. This is Palm Sunday. Now, the word Hosanna means this. It means save us now. Hosanna, it means save us now. It means we're tired of this mess. Get us out of here. Save us, Jesus. And proclaiming him the son of David, of course, their greatest king. They knew he wasn't the actual son of David. He was the great, 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 great grandson of David. But they're proclaiming him 
to be the son of David. And as they come, they would have done this, what we would call today, antiphonally. That means half the crowd would have said one thing, the other crowd would have said something, and they'd be going back and forth. This is how they would do things on the road to Jerusalem. Now, in fact, we've done this, we may do it even on Easter, is many of the Psalms were written to be done as you ascend up to Jerusalem. And they would do these antiphonal things, where some of the crowd would say this, and then they would answer back and forth. It's a way of of, uh, passing time on the road. It's a way of worshiping. I I think of the military. I don't know what you came to do, and they answer back and forth. It's kind of this kind of a thing. And, and so, if you got your, your, your palm, let's do this. Let's hold those up. Okay. And we're going to split this room right down the middle. Okay. You guys one side, you guys the other. We're about 50-50 today, so that's good. Balcony, you can pick whatever side you want to be on. Okay. And so, this half of the room, you're going you're to wave your palm, and you're going to say, Hosanna to the Son of David. So, let's practice. You ready? Hosanna to the Son of David. Let's do it again. Just this side. Hosanna to the Son of David. Okay. Then you guys will answer. You got your, you got your thing ready to go here? Okay, you're going to go Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Okay, let's practice. It's Palm Sunday. Nobody's too cool to do this. Okay, so maybe me, but not you. Okay. Are you guys ready? On this side, we'll go back and forth three times. Ready? Here we go. Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna in the highest. Good job, you guys. All right. Now, we'll give you a chance to use these again later. So, anyway, his, uh, his enemies are watching. And uh, you can see it in, in the story where they say, Jesus, quiet your people down. I don't know if they were walking up next to him, if they were shouting at him, but some, they say, Jesus, quiet these people down. They're making a ruckus. And listen, the Romans are here, Jesus. They're not going to like this. So quiet them down. And Jesus says, even if they were quiet, the stones would cry out. And he meant that because this is prophetic. This is God's thing. It's going to happen that way no matter what. And so he's allowing them to do this. And understand this. He's receiving this praise. He's receiving this title. He's not saying, I'm not the guy. He's saying, I am the guy. And he's allowing them to proclaim him their king and their Messiah. Now, in the midst of all of this, what would seem to be celebratory and loud and all kinds of stuff going on there along this road, you would think Jesus would be smiling ear to ear, wouldn't you? you think he would be like, woohoo, yes, like the Seahawks when they won the Super Bowl, right? You know, just, yes, I'm coming in, I'm the guy. But when you read the story, in reality, it says he was crying. He's sitting on the donkey and tears are coming down his face. Let's review again in Luke 19, 41. Luke 19 and 41, I have to hurry. As he drew near, he saw the city, and he wept over it, saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this, your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Jesus is weeping because he recognizes that in that moment they're proclaiming him their king, but they didn't really get it. They didn't really understand. They were thinking a military leader would make for peace. But we all know that wars just begin more wars. We're seeing that even now. They're proclaiming him their king like King David, and they're not understanding he's come to be their perfect sacrificial lamb. He's not going to be sitting on David's throne. He's going to be hanging on a cross. And he's weeping as he sees the people all caught up in this, but not understanding, not understanding what was going to happen. And he looked ahead. Prophetically, Jesus knew 
This is happening somewhere around A.D. 30 to 33, somewhere in there, that in A.D. 70, 40 years later, that whole place would be brought to the ground. They would level Jerusalem. It was conquered in A.D. 70. They burned it to the ground in A.D. 70. And he knew that. He knew it. And so he's weeping for it. He says, you don't know the time of your visitation. They didn't know what he was about. They didn't get the peace he was talking about. They didn't understand who was coming into town. And friends, as we come to the conclusion, I have to just tell you that it's still the same today. So many folks do not get the time of their visitation. They don't get the peace that Jesus is talking about. He's not talking about political peace. He's not talking about military peace. He's not talking about the peace that comes from religion. He's talking about the peace that, having, that comes from having peace with God. That's what he's talking about. Politicians come and go. Governments come and go. Battles come and go. But your walk with God can be secure through the peacemaker, Jesus Christ. He's the peacemaker. So when we proclaim him king and we worship and we wave our palm, let's understand here, we're not talking about uh, a new earthly government here. We're not talking about some presidential candidate. We are talking about Jesus Christ, the Lord of lords and the prince of peace in our lives. On Good Friday, we'll talk about that, sac that night of the sacrifice on the cross. Remember, they picked the lamb on Monday. Four days later, he'd hang on the cross. And that's what we do on Good Friday. And that's at uh, oh, 6.30 Friday. The bus will be there for 6 at your place for the bus riders. So the story goes from this triumphant moment, right, church? Just a few days later to hanging on the cross. But we know that's not the end of the story. Because three days later, he's alive. And that's Easter. That's Easter. I guess we just close with this question. How's your, how's your peace this morning? How's your peace level? Are you feeling peaceful? Is your heart at peace? Is your heart at peace? We know that perhaps somebody here, perhaps very likely somebody watching me right now online, your heart is not at peace. You're concerned, you're anxious, you're full of anxiety. Perhaps you've been looking for God, searching for God. Perhaps you were raised in a religious home, full of religion, do's and don'ts and rules and stuff, and it wasn't peaceful at all. It was conflict. We know many families who say, we don't come to church on Sunday because we just, it's just too hard to get everybody down. There's too much fighting. <laughs> but that's not what Jesus came for. Jesus came to give us peace. And we can know his peace. Peace with God, peace with each other. By receiving him in our hearts. See, just knowing it isn't enough. You can know a lot of things. I could know how to get on a rocket ride to the moon, but I wouldn't know how to build one. Amen? I mean, a person may know about God. It doesn't mean they know God. So we're going to have a prayer, and then we're going to worship. And we're going to invite you as we're singing and worshiping with these great songs this morning, that if you'd like to, you could wave your palm as part of your worship. When you lift your hands, you can lift your palm. <clears throat> Again, just declaring Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. So let's bow our heads. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you that peace with God is available through the cross, through Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, that your death brings us to a place where our sins are atoned for, a place where our lives can be changed, where we can be born again with a fresh start and a reboot. So, Heavenly Father, I just am praying right now for that person listening to my words who's wanting to know the peace of God, who needs to know the peace of God. Life has been hard. It's hard to understand. But they can know peace.
Now, if that's you, you would simply say a prayer to invite Jesus to come into your heart. You say a prayer for him to come into your heart. You could say something like this. You could say, Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner. I know I've messed up many times. And I know I need Jesus Christ to forgive me of my sins. So I receive him in my heart. I open my heart to him. I receive him as my Lord and Savior. Lord, come into my heart. Make me fresh and new. I believe in you. I want to know you better. In Jesus' name, amen. He's a good God, right, church? Hey, listen, we're going to take a minute to get plugged in, and then we're going to worship the Lord. Why don't you stand and maybe turn to a neighbor and say, that was a great sermon. Whoa. All right. This morning as we worship, we are just going to proclaim Hosanna. God save us because there is, there is nothing greater that we need except God. And we are... Um, so thankful that we're able to come together and worship him because there is power in worshiping the Lord together. And so we encourage you to sing and clap and proclaim even louder than your neighbor. See if you can be louder than your neighbor today. But we're proclaiming the greatness of God. We are proclaiming his love, his mercy. And we are just celebrating all of those things um, because he is a God who um, is worthy of our praise. He deserves glory and honor. And we ascribe all glory, honor, and power to him. And so we encourage you to sing and clap and uh, just worship him. And um, let's, just, let's just take these, this time to focus on him and worship him together. Yeah. 